We're the Avengers. We can bust arms dealers all the live long day, but that up there, that's, that's the end game. How are you guys planning on beating that? Together. Hi everyone, it's Charlie. Hopefully you guys have had a chance to see Avengers Endgame by now. These are going to be my Easter eggs from the movie in references to all the previous MCU movies. There were so many callbacks. What I'm going to do is, is if my video gets way too long past like 15 minutes, I'll just break it in half and do a part two. Because the movie is three hours long, of course there's going to be a crazy number of Easter eggs. So if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the Marvel videos. It's not stopping here. We have Spider-Man Far From Home this summer. Then we have Comic-Con, where we'll probably get our official Marvel Phase 4 schedule to learn about exactly what's coming next, even though we have a pretty good idea. We're still doing the Infinity Gauntlet giveaway too for the next couple of weeks. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave an Avengers comment on the video. Obviously careful for spoilers, if you have not seen Avengers Endgame yet, we'll be talking about very specific stuff. So here we go. Opening the movie is the Hawkeye scene where we learn what happened to his family before the snap or during the snap while it's happening because while Hawkeye is teaching his daughter, played by Joe Russo's daughter in real life, to shoot a bow and arrow, she's apparently a chip off the old block because she hits the bullseye, he high fives her and says good job Hawkeye, which is a reference to Matt Fraction's Hawkeye run where he was training the Kate Bishop Hawkeye who also used his name. Both of them called each other Hawkeye in really funny moments throughout the series. The song playing over the opening credits is Dear Mr. Fantasy. They get rescued by Captain Marvel. There were a lot of questions about the timeline, how this worked, where did she come from, what about the Captain Marvel post credit scene. Just assume right after the events of the Captain Marvel post credit scene where she shows up and says, where's Fury answering the page, she turns right back around to go to space because they tell her that Tony is probably stuck on his way home. So she was probably just flying on her way to Titan looking for him along the way and just happened to find their ship. They did not do the Stan Lee intro logo like they did for the Captain Marvel movie though. They just took it back to the regular Marvel Studios logo. When Iron Man comes back, he makes a reference to Avengers Age of Ultron in his suit of armor around the world. There were probably more references to Avengers Age of Ultron than almost any other movie besides the original Avengers movie. He calls Rocket a Build-A-Bear and then sort of at a bit of insanity as he starts to go a little bit nuts because he's been stuck in space for so long, he rips off his arc reactor, slaps it in Cap's hand and says, you put this on and you hide. The interesting thing about that is that during Marvel Phase 4, they're doing a what if comic book series where it's what if Peggy Carter had got the super soldier serum and Steve Rogers had worn an Iron Man suit built by Howard Stark. So a lot of people were curious why there was no traditional post credit scene because typically Marvel movies will have a scene at the end of the movie or during the credits that'll explain what's coming next. But the difference in Avengers Endgame is that they put those scenes during the actual movie. So there are several scenes throughout the movie that let you know exactly what these characters are going to be doing during phase four. It's just that some of those movies and characters will pop up in the past, not in the future, Captain America being one of them, because in the future, he's old man Cap now. When they go to kill Thanos on his farm, Rocket is now official captain of the Benatar because all the other Guardians are either gone or dead, and Nebula is kind of a half-Guardian, half-Avenger. But he does a roll call asking, who here has not been into space? Captain America, Black Widow, War Machine all raise their hands because within the MCU, they are the only ones in here that have never been to outer space. He says, none of you better throw up on my ship then. When they get to his farm, you see the Scarecrow from the comics. And in the end of the Infinity Gauntlet comic book storyline, he had become a farmer. So that's what he's doing here. The work is done, but... Thor goes for the head second time around, so they kill Thanos within the first 10 to 15 minutes of the movie. There's a five year time jump and you get a cameo from Joe Russo, one of the directors, playing one of the survivors in Captain America's grief counseling group. One of the other cameos is from Jim Starlin, creator of Thanos in the comics, and a couple other big cosmic characters that we'll probably see during phase four. The Easter egg for Captain America here is that he's sort of taken over Falcon's job because this is kind of what Falcon did back during Winter Soldier. It's a five year time jump, so you're jumping around, finding out what everyone's like five years later, but you finally pick up with Ant-Man. That rat that helped him get out of the quantum realm is probably the true hero of the movie. You get a cameo from Ken Jeong. There were a couple community cameos. There's so many community people that have cameoed in the MCU now, but Ken Jeong was supposed to star during Avengers Infinity War, but a scheduling conflict kept him out. The Russos brought him back during Avengers Endgame to play the manager of the warehouse where Scott Lang's van has been this whole time. The other community cameo was Yvette Nicole Brown, who played a secretary in the 1970s S.H.I.E.L.D. base from Winter Soldier, where they were going to get the Pym Particles. 
you get a very big Namor teaser when we go back to the Avengers base when Black Widow is still liaising with the other surviving Avengers around the world, keeping tabs on everything that's happened. Okoye says that near Wakanda, there was an underwater earthquake incident. She says, we handle it by not handling it because it's an underwater earthquake. That is probably the biggest Namor teaser for Marvel Phase 4 that they could have done. Yes, because of a rights issue, they can't do a Namor solo movie quite as easily. It's the same situation with the Hulk movies. Can't quite do it because Universal has the rights, but they can still use the Namor character in other people's movies. So maybe appearance during Black Panther 2. But Captain Marvel is wearing a different darker blue and red costume from the comics, and she has her short haircut from the comics too. A lot of people were wondering why her hair was different. They were just doing a comic book thing. She's still off policing Kree scroll space during that five year span because remember, everywhere around the universe, every planet had 50% of all life erased. Hawkeye becomes Ronin and goes around killing criminals that survived the snap. Rocket gets his blue costume from the Guardians of the Galaxy comics from the Annihilation Conquest storyline when that first team from the MCU originally formed in the comics. Iron Man has gotten married to Pepper Potts. He's living in nature in a cabin with a little bit of technology. They've had a daughter named Morgan Stark, which is a reference to an uncle of Tony's in the comics who's actually a villain. She comes out of her tent in the yard wearing Pepper Potts rescue armor from the comics. That's right, Pepper Potts gets her full rescue armor that she wears much later in the film during the big third act battle. He jokes that mommy never wears the things that I buy for her, but they're also winking at the fact that she, Morgan Stark, might at some day become one of the young Avengers and take up his mantle as Iron Man or Iron Heart or whatever you want to call her. Just remember that because of what happened to Tony Stark, she is now his heir apparent so that eventually when she's a teenager and old enough, say like the same age as Scott Lang's daughter who's a teenager now, she's old enough to join the Young Avengers and actually start wearing some of that gear because he says you like to go into the garage. Oh, I found it. You weren't looking for this? Oh, well, daddy likes to go into the garage too, which at this point in his life is sort of a lo-fi version of his original basement where he used to tinker with all of his gear. There were a lot of people that claimed that they saw X-Men names on the memorials as Ant-Man is walking around through the Presidio near the San Francisco Bridge trying to find out whether or not his family names are on there. I could not find any X-Men names, but it makes sense that they wouldn't put any on there because the movie was made before the Fox Disney deal was done, so they couldn't include any traditional X-Men stuff. But when he goes back to his house to look for Cassie, he finds her. She's a teenager now. And because the movie ends five years in the future in 2023, when they do the Ant-Man and the Wasp sequel, presumably she'll still be a teenager and will be able to participate in things a la stature from the comics because there's a version of Cassie Lang once she becomes a teenager who joins the Young Avengers and acts a little bit like Ant-Man does, becoming giant woman, so to speak. They call her stature, but she has the same abilities as Ant-Man in the comics. There was a lot of Young Avengers teasing going on during this. There have been rumors that they're working on a Young Avengers movie for a long time, but nothing official from Marvel has been said. They go to Tony to try and get his help. They make a bunch of Back to the Future jokes. Your plan isn't based on Back to the Future, is it? Tony references the vision he had during Age of Ultron. I didn't want to think it was real, but now it seems like it was. The thing is, is that during the third act battle with Thanos, you actually see Captain America's shield get cracked by Thanos' sword. It almost winds up looking exactly like his vision, albeit with a big twist because they wind up winning the day. They talk about Doctor Strange. He calls him the Bleecker Street Magician because Doctor Strange lives on Bleecker Street. There were actually ballet shoes on Black Widow's desk after that five years later time jump. Remember, she was a ballerina in the Age of Ultron flashbacks. We still haven't learned a lot about her backstory. That's what the Black Widow prequel movie is probably going to tell us. They go to find Hulk because they need a big brain to help them figure out time travel, and he's become Professor Hulk. Bit disappointing that we didn't get to see that happen, but the way that Banner explains it is, is that about 18 months after the snap, he goes to a gamma lab and messes with himself and the Hulk a little bit more, and that's how he became Professor Hulk. So he did more gamma experiments about 18 months after the snap. And for those of you that are wondering, yes, he can still go back to being Banner if he wants, but the whole idea that he explains in the diner while he's wolfing down all that food and taking selfies with the kids is that he thinks the Hulk is the answer now, not the problem, so he likes the Hulk, so he doesn't want to go back to just being Banner. Professor Hulk, of course, big comic book Easter egg. There was a long run where he was a more chatty, intelligent version of Banner with the body of the Hulk. Just the best of both worlds, as he says during the movie, the mind of Banner in the body of the Hulk. 
When they're first experimenting with time travel using the van before Iron Man comes back, they have to use Hank Pym's quantum suit from Ant-Man and the Wasp. They make the white suits and they have to test it out. Hawkeye volunteers. They make a couple of jokes about time travel movies. They say A Wrinkle in Time, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Time After Time, Terminator, Time Cop, Hot Tub Time Machine, and even though it's not a time travel film, Iron Man calls Fat Thor Lebowski. So the funny thing about a couple of those references are, is, is that there are other MCU actors in this movie and in other big MCU movies that starred in the movies that they reference. So Lebowski was played by Jeff Bridges, who was Obadiah Stane. Nobody makes a reference to it. Say Lebowski looks an awful lot like that Obadiah Stane guy. And Sebastian Stan was the villain of Hot Tub Time Machine. Obviously, nobody makes a reference to that either. But the rules of time travel that the MCU writers went with when they were writing Avengers Endgame were basically Dragon Ball Z rules. You can't do anything in the past to change your future. The future that you come back to will always be the same. What happens is, is when you change the past, you're only creating alternate realities, alternate timelines. So even though they take the Infinity Stones back to where they stole them from to prevent that from happening, there's still a couple of loose ends like the Loki that got away with the Tesseract. So there's a very big alternate timeline shooting out from 2012. There were a couple other moments like that. So there still are some alternate timelines that they inadvertently create. When Professor Hulk and Rocket go to New Asgard to pick Thor up, New Asgard is in the place where Odin told Thor to put it on the cliffside of Norway. Valkyrie comes back for a cameo. There are only a few Asgardians left because, remember, only about half escaped from Thor's ship before Thanos blew everyone up. Then half of those that survived got snapped. So they're way down, but Thor has completely gone PTSD and is trying to ignore everything, ignore reality. He's got this giant beer belly. He's living with Korg and Meek playing Fortnite. They even include gameplay from Fortnite in the movie. I don't know if that was a paid integration or if it was just a reference because Fortnite in real life does a lot of Infinity War Avengers tie-ins like they did the Thanos with the gauntlet last year. But in the comics, New Asgard was actually inside Oklahoma. So this is just their version of comic book New Asgard on planet Earth. Remember the ice cream from Infinity War, the Hulka Hulka burning fudge, stark raving hazelnuts? During the time travel sequence when they're trying to figure things out, Professor Hulk is actually eating some of his ice cream, Hulka Hulka burning fudge. When they finish constructing the time travel platform when they're on the white suits, you notice that the design as they're staring down at it is the exact same design as Iron Man's original arc reactor that Pepper gave him, proof that Tony Stark has a heart. That is not a coincidence because they bring that arc reactor back during his funeral at the end of the film. So it's just another very cool Easter egg and reference to the original Iron Man movie. One of the more important touchstones for Avengers Endgame that it kept calling back to because of the very notable I am Iron Man moment at the end of the film. Because Ant-Man doesn't know anything about the Infinity Stones, they have to launch into a giant explainer while they're figuring out where they're going to send all the teams back to. Thor launches into a big explainer for Thor the Dark World trying to explain the plot of that film to them. But the three different times that they go back to are 2012, the Battle of New York during the original Avengers movie because there are three Infinity Stones, because they have the Time Stone with the Ancient One who's still alive, because it's five years before Doctor Strange becomes Doctor Strange Sorcerer Supreme. They have the Mind Stone because of Loki and his scepter and the Tesseract in the Space Stone. Black Widow and Hawkeye go to Vormir to get the Soul Stone before the events of Infinity War. The Nebula and War Machine go to Morag before the events of the Guardians of the Galaxy movie so that they can get the Power Stone before Peter Quill gets it. They shot a lot of new footage for some of these scenes, particularly the Battle of New York, because they're trying to steal the stones from the end of the original Avengers movie. So they've already taken down Loki. They're putting him in captivity. They bring back cameos from Robert Redford, who's playing his character. They bring back everyone from that Winter Soldier elevator scene. Does anyone want to get off here? But Cap says, Hail Hydra, which is actually a reference to Hydra Cap and obviously all the Hail Hydras that happened during the Winter Soldier movie. They shot a new scene for that other elevator scene when they make Hulk take the stairs. So many stairs. Apparently 2012 Iron Man wears Axe body spray. You can make fun of him all you want to for that. But while they're trying to get the Tesseract, Hulk busts out because so many stairs he's pissed off. The Tesseract gets into the hands of Loki from 2012 who takes it and escapes off to who knows where. But remember, our version of Loki from Infinity War is still dead. So if we see this Loki come back and interact with other characters in present day, say during As Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, because that's kind of what that movie is now, then it'll be the alternate reality version of Loki. It won't be Thor's Loki from his original timeline. 
Captain America fights himself from 2012, who's a little bit more of a do-gooder. He hasn't been through the events of Winter Soldier. He's not quite as jaded. 2012 Cap gives him the I can do this all day reference. Our Cap goes, yeah, yeah, I know, I got it. They pretty much fight each other to a standstill, but our Cap gets young Cap by saying Bucky's still alive because this is before the events of Winter Soldier, so young Cap has no idea what's going on. Then when he's walking away, he looks at himself, who's kind of flipped over and says, that really is America's ass, is a call back to Ant-Man's quote from earlier in the film. Then I think what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to call time on this video because it's starting to get super long and I'll pick up part two of my Easter eggs with what happens when they go back to the 1970s. So just look out for my part two Easter egg just continuing on in the film. Like I said, the movie's three hours long, so there's a crazy number of Easter eggs. While you wait for everything, click here for my video on the ending in that special little moment during the end credit scene, and click here for my brand new Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 4 trailer video. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I love you 3000.